Hi, I'm Andy Weibel, and welcome to Timely Topics. Today we have with us Dave Alexander, a familiar face to many, I'm sure, or at least a familiar pen. And uh, he has just made a job transition from M Live and the Muskegon Chronicle to downtown Muskegon now. And uh, welcome. Thanks for having me, Andy. Um, and so now you're executive director. Executive director is the title. Yes, yeah. I uh, began that January 4th, the downtown Muskegon Now. And okay. it's the uh, independent agency that handles uh, downtown economic development and uh, marketing, promotion, and events. Okay. And uh, I began uh, after a uh, long career with the Chronicle and M Live. Right, right. And so um, first tell us a little bit about what downtown Muskegon now is, is that, uh, you said it's independent, independent it's a, how's it funded? It's a um, uh, non-profit agency, okay. uh, independent 15-member uh, board that I uh, was hired by and report to. Andy Majeski of uh, Revel is uh, the chair, uh, outgoing chair was uh, Carla Hill okay. from the um, Symphony Orchestra sure. and we've got a very good group of people who are committed to downtown in terms of uh, giving us uh, direction uh, from that board. Mm -hmm. And um, it is uh, spun off of uh, Muskegon area first, and it used to be a, an outgrowth uh, or a uh, uh, part of that organization mm -hmm. in terms of its organization, and now is uh, independent on its own as a 501c3 nonprofit. Okay. And uh, but it's still the fiduciary still remains Muskegon area first, and that is our local economic development agency that uh, handles uh, economic development on all levels throughout the entire Muskegon County. And um, uh, Ed Garner, the president of um, Muskegon Area First, is the treasurer of the Downtown Muskegon Now Board. Okay. So um, I officially am a uh, employee of Muskegon Area First, but uh, report uh, directly to uh, to the board. So it's kind of under the umbrella, but it's it is separate. It is separate. Yeah. Uh, and and it really what it does, uh, I like to see it as, and it sort of goes with what my background is, is working both with government and with business and sort of being a liaison to bring those two together in okay. terms of making things happen in our, in our downtown. Wow, so um, how'd you decide to do this? I mean, why, why make a I, I always knew that I would not be a journalist forever. Okay. Um, but I was for 34 years. So that's a pretty long time. That's a long time. I came here as a very young man. Yeah. I had some hair, actually, back then, Andy, <laughs> when uh, I arrived in Muskegon. I may have had You may have had a couple too. of strands <laughs> then, too, probably so. But I, uh, I came here in 1981, uh, three weeks out of graduation from Central Michigan University, um, where I was, uh, got a degree in political science and journalism and was the uh, editor of the school newspaper, CM Life. And I thought, well, I'd be here about three years, go on to Lansing, go on to Washington for my political reporting career yeah. that uh, never really got beyond Muskegon because I fell in love with this place. Okay. Uh, water, um, I'm a sailor, a uh, kayaker now, yeah. and um, water just... Uh, the job drew me here, but it was the water that has kept me here and has made me a, a lifelong Muskegon resident. So I knew this was my last and only uh, after college uh, professional um, newspaper or media company mm -hmm. position. And then I wanted to get into either communications or uh, community development. Uh, I didn't know when, uh, but uh, the Chronicle and MLive um, have a early retirement program that after uh, age 55, I'm now 56, gave me the opportunity to do an early retirement okay. and uh, look at a second career. So I'm definitely not retired. <laughs> uh, this has not felt like a retirement job yeah. the last three weeks that I've been involved with downtown Muskegon now. And uh, I'm just thrilled to uh, have the opportunity to work with the people and the issues that I worked with so many years as a government and business reporter. And in the last two years as editorial page editor, and community engagement specialist at uh, MLive to continue that on um, here in this new position in town for okay. me. Okay, so, so what do you uh, foresee yourself really doing in these uh, first six months other than getting familiar with the job? Familiar with the job is really what I need to be familiar with because if it's the issues or the personalities of the people, the history mm -hmm. or the vision of where we're going with our downtown, um, I've lived that. I've been a downtown employee for 34 years. I've covered all the major um, developments from the uh, yeah, creation of uh, Heritage Landing uh, to the uh, development of what was a Hilton first uh, with now what is the Holiday Inn and the Convention Center that the county put up uh, with the uh, meeting space associated with that. Down to the two breweries, uh, Unruly and Pigeon Hill that came in and uh, 
the uh, Muskegon Farmers Market that's downtown. I've covered all of those. Right. So um, I've got a really good feel for that mm -hmm. and, and a feel for where this community wants to go, where the downtown Muskegon uh, now board wants to go. And um, uh, so that is uh, very comfortable ground. Uh, I'm learning uh, a one-person agency. We've got two contracted employees um, to uh, running a nonprofit and uh, I not only work with the Downtown Muskegon Now Board, but also with the uh, new Business Improvement District Board. I provide staff services for them, okay. and also for the uh, uh, Downtown Muskegon Development Corporation, which was the uh, consortium of uh, foundations that got together after the um, uh, purchase of the old Muskegon Mall property, its demolition, and then its redevelopment. And they still have sites on there, uh, especially along Western Avenue that we are uh, looking to fill and mm -hmm. uh, completing uh, um, the gaps that are in, in the downtown right, created right. from that uh, era back uh, with the demolition of the mall. Right, right. So when you came, the mall was probably already here. It was here. I, I remember one of my first memories of the mall was covering its 10-year anniversary. Uh, that must have been in 86. So I was here about five years. I believe it opened up in 76. Okay. Wow. So do you, I mean, just Thinking of the mall, is that was that a, a bright day of downtown, or the was the mall was the mall when it was put up was an ingenious concept of putting four or five blocks of your main downtown and creating basically what is a suburban mall. I yeah. mean, if you take a look at the malls of the '60s and '70s and and '80s, uh, they had uh, on each end a uh, anchor. Uh, for us, it was Stuckadies and Sears. Right. Um, now, if you go out to uh, the Lakes Mall, it's uh, it's Sears and Pennies, Pennies. and uh, Yonkers, yeah. um, but there it was uh, created in our downtown. There, there was walking streets or, or pedestrian malls that mm -hmm. you could see like uh, in uh, Kalamazoo in, in some areas, but we went one step further and uh, created that building atmosphere, yeah. climatically controlled and looking every much like a mall from a suburban setting inside, but if you go outside, you see it's very different because the building still rose from them. And right, right. Uh, one of the buildings, the Comerica Bank building was, was part of that, or the Century Club was at the end of it. So those buildings uh, remained uh, part of the old structure. And uh, for years, um, 20 years, it was the destination of the lakeshore in terms of, of where we were shopping at. And downtown from the days of, uh, uh, that people remember, prior to the mall of West Western Avenue and its heyday of the of 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, that was recreated in a very different way, but still it's significant economic and socially, I think, to Muskegon mm -hmm. until um, its day had come. And that right. was at the end of the 1990s and the 2000s as Sternberg Road went in. Right, right. And it, so, so you think that was a, a, a kind of, Muskegon downtown is better today because of that mall? It, it held some of our institutions together, I uh -huh. think. Take a look at what, it is not only the um, central business district, but it's the institutional center. And I, and I would point to uh, the Skegan Museum of Art. I would point to Hackley Library, point to the Hackley Hume House, yeah. Lakeshore Museum Center, sure. and even the, obviously, the Froenthal, our crown jewel of, uh, of our arts uh, uh, community and uh, entertainment community. Um, and then Elsie uh, Walker Arena. These are significant institutions that draw us together, that define us as a community. Right. They are in the downtown. Um, because of the Muskegon Mall, I think we had the uh, Holiday Inn built, and it was a Hilton, 1986, when that went up. So all of those elements of what is now critical to downtown Muskegon, not only uh, in the past, its current situation, mm -hmm. and obviously for the future, I think they were all held together because the Muskegon Mall was downtown. You do, did mention earlier there are some gaps, though, now. Yes, we do have and, gaps. And would those gaps have been there without the mall? They would probably be uh, vacant buildings. Uh, if I you see. take a look at some other cities our uh -huh. size that may have had struggling downtowns, um, we were able to remove some of the older buildings uh, at uh, um, some people's pleasure and at some people's displeasure right, when right. it happened. I wasn't here during those uh, urban development times. Uh, of uh, the uh, late 60s and early 70s, but um, that was done. It is the history that we have, it's the legacy that we have, and we are now filling those in terms yeah. of, of getting the, uh, the proper mix of uh, commercial, office, and uh, residential along our downtown Main Street, which is Western Avenue. Right, I remember um, after the mall was uh, done, uh, there was, uh, you know, imagine Muskegon, what are we gonna, what are we gonna do with downtown? 
One of the ideas was just basically to bulldoze the whole thing and start over with a whole everything new. Uh, do you think we, it's good? We did, we, not go, we did not go in that direction. Yeah, there was a de good? bright developer that decided that uh, they had a proposal on the table to uh, downtown Muskegon Development Corporation to do just that. Yeah. Basically create what uh, Prairie Village would have looked like a suburban setting. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we've done is, uh, is uh, retained at least five of the buildings that were of the original mall property and obviously all the other historic structures that are in the surrounding area and especially those um, institutional buildings, uh, Froenthal, Hackley Library, Hackley Administration Building that really provide the character and make us unique as Muskegon. Okay. And um, uh, so what we were able to do is um, with the Imagine Muskegon plan is not just put up, I would say, stick figure buildings right. for the sake of, of creating space, but um, as John Allickson, a former uh, city commissioner and a longtime planning commission member in the city of Muskegon said, we are deciding 100 year decisions here as we put Imagine Muskegon into action. And it wasn't going to happen overnight. It, it comes on um, a parcel at a time as people need and uh, want to uh, be located in the downtown. And it's grown in, uh, organically instead mm -hmm. of just being flash created. I think there's a lot more sustainability to that. There's a whole heck of a lot more character and charm right, right. There is and, that. and uniqueness that is Muskegon that uh, can be created in that. And um, that's uh, now hopefully we can complete those properties. Um, and that's one of the uh, um, directives of downtown Muskegon now. Yeah, I guess the, the downside is it, it's a slow progress and people like to see we it are go on a quicker. Journey. Yeah. We, and, and I, but that becomes sustainable if we do it for the right purpose. And I, I look at Baker College in terms of the uh, Culinary Institute of uh, Michigan, mm -hmm. that building, that, that is there. It's a landmark. It will be there for long beyond, I believe, you and I will right, be in Muskegon. Right. And now your, your institution, Muskegon yeah. Community College, so thankful taking my old building, yeah. uh, the Chronicle, where I worked uh, probably for about 30 years prior to going over to the M Live Media Group and, and we did the transition, to have that be a uh, publicly held space. It's a beautiful building. You've got some gorgeous plans and we hope to see that you know, yeah. start up in, uh, in April or May and, uh, and you in, in the next year and a half down there. It's, it's key to, uh, to keeping the character and the uh, uniqueness of Muskegon. Right. But so what, what should be our goal for Mis downtown Muskegon? I mean, do we want to be Saugatuck no. or Grand Haven? We aren't Saugatuck. We aren't Grand Haven. We aren't White Lake uh, in terms of Montague or um, Whitehall either. We are uniquely Muskegon. Yeah. Uh, it was a uh, industrial downtown uh, well before I got here. Uh, and when I got here, it, 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 that had sort of gone away. So we were in transition. Um, it, it needs to reflect uh, the legacy of that and, and of the uh, bustle and uh, the uh, time when uh, right before and after World War II we had 10,000 people working downtown wow. and in terms of Continental Motors, in terms mm -hmm. of, uh, of Lakey Foundry and the associated industries that were mm -hmm. along the waterfront. That waterfront now being recreated to a mixed use uh, residential um, and, and it, that's still key to the downtown and we need to attract uh, folks to the waterfront and we need to then connect the downtown to that waterfront. So yeah, that's a, how do that we, is do, a key, that is a how key do we connect the downtown well, to the waterfront? We, 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 have, we, we had issues, we then uh, find solutions and they create more issues. This, the solution uh, to having the waterfront be part of our integral uh, identity as a, as a community on the Muskegon Lakefront was Shoreline Drive. And before Shoreline Drive we had Webster and Muskegon, and they sure. were four lanes in both directions, and it was a um, state trunk line. That state trunk line moved uh, over a course of two projects to Shoreline Drive, and that created, um, uh, I think, people's identity with uh, places like uh, Shoreline Inn, the Lake House, sure. uh, the LST, and especially Heritage Landing. So that was all positive, but then what did it do? Those two lanes of traffic going in both directions now four lanes there, has created sort of a barrier between the traditional downtown, which can be seen at the uh, uh, traffic circle that was created uh, through the plan of uh, Imagine Muskegon at 3rd and Western, sure. to the downtown, With the hunt statue. to, to the um, uh, waterfront. So now 
there's that that we need to overcome. Right. And there's right. ways of doing that. And it, there's, yeah, because it's not real comfortable no. walking. There is. There's probably thing. Third Street, uh, which would be going over to uh, um, the uh, Mark Dock area and Shoreline Inn. There is uh, the end of Terrace, mm -hmm. um, which would be going over to uh, U.S. Uh, um, Harbor 31 now the it's called, the Tool Tool property that used yeah. to be called uh, Edison Landing. Okay. Uh, so there's that business park and now the, uh, uh, the uh, Terrace Point um, residential community okay, that's right. being created out on the point out there. And then at, at Heritage Landing, so there's three real points and that's 7th Street mm -hmm. that we need to get over. You can go over it or you can go under it. And I always like looking at going to Oak Street Beach in Chicago. And if you're at the end of um, the Miracle uh, Mile of uh, Michigan Avenue and you want to get to Oak Street, you go underneath, underneath of, yeah. of Lakeshore Drive in Chicago. I could see one of those places going under and then going over top of, obviously, yeah. a uh, pedestrian walkway that would be able to go so, over so then Shoreline Drive and, and make that connection to the bike path of Lakeshore Trail and to, uh, to the waterfront still, amenities. Yeah, right now, though, there's not really a a place to go when you get there. I mean, there's not really a, a, a residential, or, I'm sorry, a, a public park or something that would be available. Heritage Landing is a, is a huge oh, public that, park, yeah. down at that end. Down at that um, end. And, and then it's in more in the middle of our downtown waterfront is uh, very much a uh, um, uh, privately held, both right. from the uh, Mart Dock in terms of the commercial docking and, and uh, activities there, but then also um, with uh, the lake house at Shoreline and the uh, Terrace Point uh, Marina, that has really become a hub of the downtown, even though it's private. It's really a hanging place, and if mm -hmm. anyone's on the deck at uh, the lake house in the summer, you know what I mean. Right, right. This uh, job, now you uh, have a, 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 almost can feel it, a promotional oh, aspect there is of your much. job, right? I, I've always loved Muskegon. Um, I can now express it in different ways. Right. But, so before when you were at the newspaper, it was probably more you had to have a critical eye. And, and, and one in, in which I, I was to uh, analyze the public policies and the personalities and mm. the uh, various projects, uh, both from a governmental, uh, as a government reporter, I covered City Hall, I covered Norton Shores, I covered Muskegon County, and the political uh, happenings in Muskegon for many years, but then also on the private sector side as a business senator. And, and yeah, you, you do take a look at it from a different way. but. Um, you can't live here for as long as I have and plan to live here the rest of my life and not fall in love with this place. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there was always a underpinning of when I did reporting, we wanted it to be uh, in a fashion that uh, informed my republic, uh, told them of the pitfalls and of the issues that are out there mm -hmm. and those that need to be solved and say, hey, here, here's something that we need to work on and uh, to try to give them the... Uh, a depth of understanding about uh, how we got to where we are at and really what the vision is going forward. And did, do you think enough people or anyone has really taken your place in that uh, looking it at is the a, government? It is a, um, uh, a different world, a media world than I entered in 1981. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was no internet, <laughs> right. let alone a, a digital product called uh, MLive or a company called the MLive Media Group. So. There, uh, as the world has profoundly changed in, in our lifetimes, mm -hmm. um, uh, the media world has changed dramatically the last 15 years. Do you think, uh, is it all, uh, I mean, w did it used to be the good old days of uh, journalism and now that's well, gone? It's sort of like looking at um, West Western Avenue in downtown Muskegon in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, I see those pictures. Glasses, you see those. Uh, and remembering those either as a child or as an adult, if, uh, if you're a senior now. Um, and uh, remembering the mall and now seeing the, uh, the tremendous uh, rev uh, birth of downtown in terms of, of, of new, for the millennials, uh, a new destination for them and for, for everyone in the community. Um, same thing has happened on the, on the media side. Um, we used to be uh, print, there was never even any color in the paper. Right. When I first came, it would be spot color, we'd call it. <laughs> so then we went to full color, four color, uh, yeah. uh, process color uh, photos and, and all the art and the uh, graphics that we could do with that. And uh, now we're doing, uh, in terms of, uh, the, from a media standpoint, uh, we are consuming uh, video and audio and, uh, and other uh, elements online that we're never even thought of when I was in journalism school so, from a print standpoint. Yeah. Um, 
this change, uh, how, how many people worked at the Chronicle uh, at its peak when you were there? And now about 210. And now how many work at AML? Yeah, uh, probably, I, I'm not there right now, yeah, right. but um, probably 25 to 30. Wow. Um, so, so it has been a dramatic change, well, but it's, it's, not as if, it's not as if those people have gone, all gone away. They have been consolidated uh, as many companies in the Muskegon area have to other places uh, in, in terms of the state and of I've, Michigan. I, I notice when I go to MLive now, and I, I still do get the physical newspaper at home, but um, I, I notice that a lot of it isn't Muskegon news, even though I have it set for that. <laughs> it's a lot of state news and from other areas. You could set it just for Muskegon News if you wanted to, in terms of doing the news feed of Muskegon. Okay. Um, but um, M Live, I believe their uh, philosophy is that M is for Michigan, and uh, yeah. this is a Michigan product, and people want to become involved in, in a larger discussion of issues that are uh, surrounding not only Muskegon, West Michigan, but the entire state. Right. Right. I, have, I ho hope we don't totally lose. I mean, that, that some worry there's not enough local left. Um, which is tough, though, I'm sure, uh, economically is, to support. It is, what, um, it is what the marketplace is demanding hmm. and the marketplace is dictating in terms of um, the news coverage that they have and, and the resource that they, are, um, that they are applying throughout the state. Yeah. And, uh, um, one, one of the things going on right now, of course, is, is the Flint water crisis. And that's a state issue that we're all interested in. Do you think uh, that could have, one of the things newspapers do is keep government and business in check and society in general and, and to make sure there aren't abuses of power and whatnot. Um, do you think the news coverage of the uh, of Flint water crisis could have been better, could have helped? Always could have been better. They could have had more resources on the ground, but I think the Flint Journal and the M Life staff in Flint have um, done an exceptional job well before any of us really knew that there was a water issue in Flint, mm -hmm. before it became a national headline. Mm -hmm. um, MLive was there. And I'm proud of uh, my uh, former colleagues in terms of what they did, both uh, on a reporting standpoint and also on uh, an opinion standpoint. Uh, but I understand there was a financial manager there, and that manager was not uh, open to uh, the democratic process in terms of uh, having elected officials that were uh, uh, more answerable to uh, the local constituency. Uh, you know, they were making uh, decisions that were based upon uh, fiscal and um, larger picture uh, budgetary issues to try to, uh, to bring uh, Flint into a uh, more of a financial health. So um, yeah. even if it was back 20 years ago, the newspaper's influence uh, may not have been as great uh, because of the financial manager situation as it was if you had, you know, uh, 11 people that were all elected uh, from the uh, neighborhoods yeah. of Flint. Yeah. Huh. Um, do you see, I mean, what's the future of newspapers in terms of, do you, do you see uh, alternative newspapers maybe uh, popping up? But they're going to have to be digital. Um, yeah. You're not going to be able to do it in print, okay? Mm -hmm. We are in a transition, yeah. a very difficult one for the industry. And it came, um, the technological changes uh, came at a time of our, our uh, greatest economic uh, downturn uh, in our lifetimes in the uh, recession, the Great Recession of 2008. Yeah. Um, so they sort of came together at the same time and uh, really hurt the newspaper industry. Mm -hmm. As I always say, our most loyal readers die every day, and um, they were not being uh, replaced right. because uh, our kids or our grandkids, uh, they are out consuming information in different ways, and um, the industry has to react and respond to that, and yeah. it has. I, I notice here we have our uh, college newspaper, mm -hmm. and uh, it is both online and, and in print. Uh, but we just are printing fewer and fewer because I asked my students, have you picked up and read the newspaper? And just that idea of picking up and reading the newspaper is not something they're familiar with. They're but like, do, well, they see, do they look at it online? That's the question. They, they do, mm -hmm. but uh, I think we, I mean, we could improve the way we're doing yeah. that. But, um, and my old newspaper, uh, Central Michigan Life, CM Life, back in uh, Mount Pleasant, um, also is in that process uh, where they have now gone to, I think, two days, uh, 
tab uh, size uh, paper, mm -hmm. and yeah, it is all online, and they're they're really embracing what M Live has done because those are the skills that those students are going to need going out into uh, the new digital world, skills that I never even knew existed right, when right. I was at J School back yeah. in Mount Pleasant. Yeah, so, so if you uh, were recommending uh, or, or talking to someone and said, you know, I think I'm a, I just saw that movie Spotlight and I think I want to be a journalist. Uh, would There's always going to be a need for people to, um, who are professionals and skilled at um, uh, taking information synthesizing it and providing it to the general public. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a need for that, but in how we do it as a, uh, as a profession and, and where that's going uh, will continue to evolve. Right. And we can't say where it's going to be five years from now. I mean, uh, what was it like prior to uh, Facebook? We don't we remember that, but that's not that many years ago. Mm -hmm. What was it prior to having Twitter? Uh, I remember going down and getting a big fat book about yay thick uh, of corporations uh, to look up a uh, company that was uh, having a merger or doing something in Muskegon as a business editor in the early 90s because there wasn't internet at my desk. Right. Okay. Right. So look how far we've come. So who knows where we're going to be at in the next five years. But for that student, uh, for that young person uh, who wants to uh, pursue that dream of uh, being a journalist, go for it because yeah. there will always be a need for it. It just may not look like it was uh, as your dad did it. Right, right. And and maybe, and and, and uh, as you're showing, those skills also are somewhat oh, tra transferable. Transfer. If you can communicate, if you can um, gather information, and you can um, uh, boil that information down to what is understandable, mm -hmm. um, that's a skill that you can use in many places in both the public, the private, and the nonprofit world. Sure, sure. And and uh, so. Do you think that newspapers, I mentioned before, just the good old days, um, what you said you were at 210 people at the Muskegon Chronicle. Um, in some ways, you were a, 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 the only game in town. <laughs> that, that you were the newspaper of Muskegon. Still if, are. Yeah, I mean, and still, of, still still are. If it would become more dispersed in terms of uh, you know, having various different uh, Technology's news. done that. Yeah. Is, is that a good thing, you think? Or was it better when there was the Chronicle? Um, it, it's a mixed bag, mm -hmm. a two-edged sword. Okay, for, so you had at least a common set of uh, impressions, facts, um, information, mm -hmm. call it what you would want, that everyone can sort of use to make decisions. Right. Um, I even set, have a and, sense and, of but community. That, but that may have, that may have uh, limited um, what we do or how we do it. Now the frustration is that we don't have that, that mm -hmm. not everyone is sort of on the same page, so to speak, right, as to right. what's happening, how it's happening, or what we should be thinking or how we should be uh, reacting to what is happening in a community. And um, you have to be a pretty savvy um, uh, digital uh, consumer of information in various ways and knowing what is uh, uh, credible and what is not mm -hmm. um, to um, having the ability to go out and discern what's going on in your community and reacting to it. Yeah. So we're all maybe reacting in different ways, but more voices are out there. That can be good, that can be bad. Sure, uh, sure. But yeah, there's a democratization of it. Uh, there's a, there is a um, uh, equaling the playing field so that uh, bloggers and uh, people who are extremely good at social media are able to continue to uh, to make a uh, influence and probably a greater influence as we go forward. Well, hey, thank you for being on the show today. And I, I, uh, well, I, I, I thank you for allowing me to uh, talk about downtown Muskegon now and obviously reminisce a little bit and look forward uh, to what's going on yeah. in uh, the media world. Well, and I wish you good luck in your next role here. Well, um, come join role. us in downtown Muskegon. You know, okay. We've got things from Taste of Muskegon and, uh, and we're going to be doing some First Friday things and, and there's a lot of development that is on the uh, the um, uh, boards and, and is being discussed and it's a very dynamic time to be right. looking at downtown Muskegon. Good, good. Uh, look forward to those first Fridays and other events going on. And so thanks for being on the show and thank you all for watching. We've been talking to Dave Alexander, now Executive Director of Downtown Muskegon Now, formerly of MLive and the Muskegon Chronicle. And until next time, have a great day.